Hello and welcome to Embedded Arm Dev. In this video and the next one, I'm going to show you how to cross compile a third party library for your target system. This video was originally going to be one video, but it got to be so long that I decided to break it into two videos. In this first video, I'm just going to give you some background knowledge for the general process of configuring, building, and installing software. In the second video, I'll give you a practical demonstration by cross compiling two third party libraries. Alright, so let's get started with the first video. So let's discuss the basic steps of the build process. First, I should point out that the process that I'm introducing in this video is the standard GNU method of building software using AutoTools and Make. So the developers and maintainers of the library are going to use AutoTools to create the necessary configuration files for the library's users, which is us, to configure and build the software. So the library source code should come with all the necessary configuration files needed to set up and configure the build. So the user, as a user, we just have to run some pretty simple configuration scripts um, to create the build environment. So the build process has three basic steps, configure, make, and install. In the configure step, the system prepares for the build process. There will be a shell script called config or configure that we will execute to configure the build environment. This is where you will specify all of the build and compile options for the library that you're building. When it comes to cross-compiling, this is a very important step to get correct. The make step is where all of the source files are compiled into object files and are linked into the final binaries, which could be executable binaries, shared libraries, or both. The make files, which are generated by the configuration script, will call the compiler and linker as necessary to create these files. In the install step, the target files, such as the compiled binaries, header files, shared objects, documentation, etc., are all copied to a specified install directory. This is important for cross-compiling for reasons that we'll go over in a few minutes. During the configure step, there are some important things to consider when cross-compiling a library. First, we will need to specify the cross-compiler that we are using. Otherwise, the system will use the default compiler, which is not what we want. Second, we'll need to specify the location of any include files and any libraries or shared objects that need to be linked into the software that we're building. Not all libraries will need this. Some will and some won't. It depends on the library and also how you're building it. Finally, we need to make sure that we specify the installation directory to be used during the install step. All right, so how do we specify the cross compiler? So normally, in most cases, you will, you're will you going to specify which cross-compiler you're using during the configure step as part of the configure command. And there's generally three ways that you can do this. The first way, and the most preferable, is to pass it in as an option to the configure command. And so in the first example, you can see that there's an option, which is uh, cross-compile prefix equals, and then you give it the value that you want. Now, notice in this one that the prefix um, gets cut off after the last hyphen. And this is where you would have the actual commands such as GCC or read elf or you know, whichever uh, particular part of the uh, compiler or linker or whatever that the, you know, the system needs to use. So it wants the prefix because it will prepend that uh, to a, the command depending on the needs of the, of the build script. Okay, again, this is the recommended method. Uh, you wanna read the documentation to see if there is an option as part of the configure, configuration options to see um, if you can use this method to specify it. If that doesn't exist, if it doesn't exist as, as, a, as an option, then you can pass it in as a command line argument. And in this case, it's gonna be an environment variable that gets passed in to configure, okay? And you can tell it's a command line argument because it comes after the configure command, okay? So normally, this is only going to happen if the configure script is looking for it, okay? Uh, I've had some experiences where I tried to specify it in this way, and then the configure script threw an error saying that this uh, environment variable wasn't defined. And so, again, you're going to have to look at the documentation to see if that is available. And the third, the final way to do it, which is the least preferable, is to specify it as an environment variable that gets exported to the configure command uh, as you call it. And, you know, m I think I've never had to do this. Uh, there, it'll work in some cases, but you definitely you want to try to use the, the first option, which is passing it in as an option. 
Okay, specify an installation directory. So what we're doing here is we're specifying the directory where the target files are going to get copied to. So this may be done as part of a configuration step or it might be done in the install step. Um, you could pass it in as an environment variable or as a command line argument. However, it's preferable to pass it in during the configuration step if, if, there, if that option is available. If this directory is not specified, then the installation will be done on the host system. So this is really, really important to, um, for cross-compiling because most of the time we don't want, if we're cross-compiling for ARM, we don't want a bunch of ARM binaries to be installed to our, uh, to our whole system, okay? Uh, because they won't work. And also it's possible that we could actually trample over existing binaries and then you'll lose functionality on your computer. So you always, always want to make sure when you're cross-compiling that you specify an installation directory so that the, ins the files are, start are installed to where you want to send them. So aside from not trashing your host system, there are two really good reasons to uh, install the target files to a specific directory. The first one is if you're trying to create a root file system that's eventually going to go on to your embedded device. So you know, you, you might create a directory where all, all of your, and it would, it would look exactly like a Linux uh, directory from the root. It would have all of the, you know, the slash bin, slash user, slash local, and all those types of directories that you need. And they would get copied into there and eventually would end up on the embedded device to be actually be used on the embedded device. Okay. So these could be files like executables, the shared objects, header files, and documentation. Um, and so that you would, put them in, in this directory for eventually getting uh, moved over to the embedded device. Another reason you might want to do this is, let's say you're just, um, you're compiling a whole bunch of, you know, libraries that you might want to be able to use for building your applications that are going to end up on the uh, embedded device. And so you're creating a cross-compiling development environment. Because if you're going to create a binary, uh, a cross-compiled binary for like ARM, then you need to have cross-compiled um, libraries to link into. You want to make sure that the, the binaries are compiled for the right architecture uh, so that you can link into them correctly. All right, so specifying include in library directories. So these can be specified in the configure step or in the install step. Uh, normally it's done during the configure step. Uh, these are needed if the library or software that we're building links into another library. Okay, and we are gonna, I'm gonna show you an example of this today. Um, so again, these are the three options. It can, be, it can be passed in as an environment variable, a command line argument, or a command line option. And again, the command line option, which usually has, starts with two hyphens, is the preferable way to do it. If, it. if the option is available, you should always use that option. All right, so what are, what are include directories? These are generally the location of the C header file, so the .h files that can that contain definitions for all of the global variables and and the functions that you might want to call. They'll belong to some third-party library, but you want to use them in your application. So these generally define the API of the file that you're linking into. And then the library directories are parallel to the header files, and these are the actual shared object files that you're trying to link into. Okay, and again, we're gonna I'm gonna show you an example of this today. Um, and so these, you, you need to have these when you want, when you go to compile your, your software or the library that you're building, um, if they need APIs from another library, you need to specify where those shared object files are located. And so generally these include directory and the library directory are going to be in the install directory that you specified in the configuration step. So that'll be, they'll be in your, um, your cross-compiled, you know, development environment. Okay, so there are some other configuration options that you may need depending on the library and your use, and these are just a couple of them we'll go over. Um, so you, you may be able to pass in environment variables needed for pre-processing, excuse me, pre-processing, compiling, and linking. Um, so like, you know, they would go uh, with the, uh, the format of var1 equals value1, var2 equals value2. So these are just going to be like environment variables that you need to pass in. CPP flags. So this is this is an actual, this would be an environment variable you would pass in. 
and these are just flags for the C and C++ preprocessor. Uh, they usually are used to include, to specify include directories. Okay, uh, and this, there you see an example of what you might uh, pass in. Okay, so LD flags, these are flags for the linker, and they generally specify locations of the shared objects. Um, and so here you have an example, LD flags equals tack L path to library. LD libs, so this is, this is what you would use to specify specify the name of the actual library that you're trying to link into. Um, in these cases, I've got LZ, which is the, the uh, you know, the Zlib, the libz, which we're going to use today, uh, LMath, which is math, and then LZ02, which is another compression library. So if you're linking into them, then you need to specify that, okay? Um, so generally, you're going to have to include all three of these um, if you're linking into a non-standard uh, directory okay and it's going to be different for each library that you're compiling okay uh, then it's important to read the documentation and in in many cases if the library is designed to be compiled with another library to be linked into another library most of the time there's going to be a, a configuration option where you will specify these particular like the location of the of the uh, shared objects and the location of the include files so every single library that you build and compile is going to be different so it's imperative that you read the documentation you look through it you make sure you understand what configuration op configuration options are available and then what needs to be passed in as an actual environment variable okay so that covers the configuration step so the next step is the make step so in this step the basically what's going to happen is they're going to call the make files that were generated by the configuration script and if you're not familiar with make uh, that's okay uh, it's essentially it is uh, you know it's, it's a very well written uh, tool that allows us to create scripts that help us call the GCC compiler or whichever compiler you're using and the linker in an intelligent way so that we can um, simplify the building process okay and pretty much anyone who's ever written any software in Linux or has even built software under, knows what, at least knows that make exists. Okay, so make is responsible for building and compiling a library. It's responsible for calling the compiler, the assembler, the linker, all of those things, okay? Uh, generally, you only need to type the make command. You don't need to pass in any variables or options. Most of the time, all of the options are specified during the configure phase. And so the next step would just be to type make and execute it. And so it'll go through and it'll build everything for you. And what this will do is it'll build all of the object files and the target binaries and everything else based on the configuration you set up. And they will still be in the directory, in the build directory. Okay. So that will become important when we talk about the, the install phase. So... Through trial and error, you might determine that you need to pass variables to the make command for it to compile properly. Um, so like this might be necessary if the variable that you're trying to pass in is not one that's included as part of the configuration script. And again, this is just, you're gonna learn this as, as when you go to try to compile a library and something doesn't work, then you're gonna have to kind of play with it to figure it out. Uh, Cause almost every library I've ever compiled has been slightly different in some way. And finally, if you want to read more about make i highly suggest that you read the uh the make manual which is available at genu.org uh, it's very long uh, but it's extremely useful and it's probably the best thing to read as far as getting up to speed on make however for this video you don't need to do that all you have to do is literally type the word make and you're good okay so for the install phase what it's going to do is it's going to copy all of the target files to the specified install directory so it's only going to copy the target files, okay? It's not going to copy any of the intermediate build, build files like the object files and configuration files and all that. It's just going to be the files that you need on your target system to actually use the software, okay? So it's only going to copy the distribution files. So one thing you want to be careful of is when you use the sudo command on the install step. If your inst the specified install directory is not configured properly and let's say it's set up to go on your 
um, your you know, like you, you didn't set it up properly and it's gonna try to install to your host directory like your you know slash bin or something like that if you're not using sudo then it probably won't let you do that and that's a good thing because you don't want to trash anything that's in your actual bin directory so just be careful when you're using the commands only use sudo if you really really have to because it, it can uh, make it so you screw up your host system okay uh, so for this reason, I highly recommend that you, you build inside a virtual environment like VirtualBox. So you create a VirtualBox environment and you do all your building and everything on that VirtualBox because if you trash it, then all you have to do is just, you know, you don't worry about it. You can just get rid of that VirtualBox, reload another one and start over. Okay? I highly recommend that you use VirtualBox or, or some other virtualization software so that if, if you do screw it up, it's easier to recover. The other thing I should point out, which is not in the slides, but technically the install, it's not a separate command. It's actually part of the make command, and it is a target uh, inside the make command. If you're not familiar with that, all you need to know is that it's basically uh, a specific, um, you're, you're telling it to go to a specific um, step uh, inside the make file, uh, which will then, you know, basically there will be instructions there for which files to copy over. Uh, and so you're actually going to run make install, not install. Install isn't the command, it's make and then install is the target that you're going to specify. In summary, there's three basic steps to building a third-party library. Um, the first is the configure step. In this step, it's important to specify the cross-compiler that you're going to use. You need to specify the locations of header files and shared objects um, that you, for any libraries that you're linking into. And then you also need to specify the installation location. This is extremely important when cross-compiling because you don't want to trash your uh, host system. The next step is the, the actual build step. Uh, calling make just builds and compiles all the files from the libraries. It's compile all the object files, everything else that you need. And then the install step, which is actually make install. And so what that does is it copies all the final target files to the specified directory. The specified directory is the installation directory that you specified in the configuration step. And again, you might use this for two specific reasons. Uh, the first one being you're creating a root file system that will end up on the embedded device, or you're just creating a development environment for cross-compiling uh, so you can build your application and link it into other libraries and anything else that you need. All right, so that does it for this video. I hope that you found it useful. And don't forget to check out the second video where I give you a practical demonstration of everything I just discussed here. See you in the next video.